So just as a little bit of background on what we are affectionately calling JADA, because as soon as something has more than two words, it becomes an acronym and then um, something that we uh, refer to by. Um, the Gender and Environment Data Alliance uh, was a commitment of the Generation Equality Forum, which many of us call Jeff now as we do things, um, in 2021. Um, the conversations, we were really excited and we do in particular was really thrilled to be one of the co-leads of the action area on climate justice. And we were really thrilled that there was an action area on climate justice, um, feeling that this was one of the critical areas that we needed to advance from the Beijing platform for action. Uh, and as we discussed among partners and co-leads, what were the critical spaces that we needed to uh, be focusing on in order to advance progress, data came up time and time again. Sexual and gender analysis, sexually um, uh, disaggregated data, uh, understanding what data look like at national level across different sectors. Um, but the other feeling was that, and, and certainly this is a feeling I had myself, that over the last decade, the one thing that we have called for in policies and in processes is data. And so what we didn't want was to leave the Generation Equality Forum with a simple line in our blueprint that we needed more data at this nexus. Um, what was what are some of the things that are holding us back? Of course, there are a vast array of challenges to why we don't have data at this nexus of gender and environment, why we don't have effective and quality gender data to begin with, why we don't have the necessary data we need on environment, for example, um, let alone why we don't have it at the nexus. But we also knew was that there were people around the world, governments, UN agencies, civil society, grassroots feminist organizations already doing the work to collect data, to collect information, analysis of what was happening at this intersection. So we also didn't want to leave the Generation Equality Forum blueprint um, as if this information didn't exist. Um, and we certainly didn't want to give the um, impression that we needed to start from scratch. So the idea of the Gender and Environment Data Alliance was born of the fact that one of the one of the ways in which we identified that we could accelerate progress was being in collaboration and community together with those who had the capacity, the interest, and the intention to advance um, at this at this nexus. Um, there was a widespread acknowledgement um, that this is that this is firmly needed to be able to advance both gender, climate, environmental policy, and we were really pleased to make this commitment with 17 founding members, um, alongside our key co-convener of this group, uh, IUCN, um, which is a, a collaborator of WeDo's for many many years now, um, and we came together to tackle this challenge. So on the next slide, we've identified what are some of the initial goals um, and objectives of Jada. Um, the first two, I think, are really framing the conversations that we've had so far. And you'll notice that the first one isn't to collect or to collect data, um, because the initial goals are around compiling and reviewing existing data and research. Um, what exists at the gender and environment nexus? How do we aggregate feminist traditional and also non-traditional um, data resources? So. You know, we knew from the start that we wanted to, although be, it would be challenging, we wanted to create an alliance that would ground feminist principles and policies in how we talked about data, what is counted and what counts, and what is the role of, for example, feminist participatory action research um, in how we think about data. Secondly, we want to amplify and then communicate disaggregated intersectional gender data to scale gender transformative policy and programming, including beyond the traditional data establishment, as we've discussed before. So a lot of what we've been discussing over since the launch of, of uh, or since the initial commitment at the Generation Equality Forum is how do we best understand what data exists and how do we communicate and amplify that data better? I think longer term goals that we have are to strengthen the capacity, for example, of statistical bureaus, other traditional data spaces and actors to catalyze best practice, to use quality data and knowledge, um, and to promote gender transformative environment and climate action. So we think we have the experts, the knowledge, uh, and the understanding to be able to create tools and resources to inform others um, on how to take this forward. And then finally, to influence norms of 
data generation, synthesis, analysis, and strengthen the mandates within intergovernmental processes um, and redefine analytical frameworks around gender, climate, and environment. Um, so ambitious goals, but um, again, what we are grounded in at both we do as well as in this in this coalition together is that we can tackle these issues when we work in collaboration. And if we try to first tackle the the challenge of what does it mean to work together um, and what can we produce together. So excited to be joined today by several of these founding members, as well as our lead consultant, who is just brought on, um, Jamita Chakma, who's undertaking a lot of the work that's informing the initial scope of this alliance to help make it a reality. Um, and before I um, before I pass over to uh, uh, the speakers, some of who are in person and some are who are uh, joining us virtual, and hopefully we will have some time for interactive discussion, I did want to apologize that we do not uh, have simultaneous interpretation for those of us who are joining us online. We do strive to always do that. Um, it was not possible today, but we will share the resources um, in English with subtitles in Spanish and French post the event. Um, so jumping right into uh, our wonderful panel, I'm going to pass over to my dear friend and colleague, Fleur Newman, who is the both the gender lead, has a, uh, as, as we all do who are feminists working in these spaces, has a title that encompasses many things, um, has been the gender lead at the UNFCCC for many years now, also leads on work around youth. Um, as well as Action for Climate Empowerment, which focuses a lot on education and participation. And so, Fleur, we'd love for you to come in uh, to share with us around what this nexus looks like under the UNFCCC, in particular in relation to the UNFCCC's Gender Action Plan um, and why this is so important in the lead up to COP27 in Egypt this year. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's, uh, it is a pleasure to be here and to be in person again. Um, so I'm going to quickly just give us a, a little bit of background into why um, in this context, in the context of climate change, uh, data is, is central. And so I thought I would start with a, a, a picture of the difference between um, a 1.5 degree pathway and a two degree pathway and what that looks like in terms of data. So it's, it's a little bit little, but the, this is data around various aspects of the difference between the climate risks related to global warming. And in this, you see uh, references to the Arctic sea ice you see water availability, um, species loss, coral loss, and then there's, there's some there around people. But what is relevant here is that we, we understand about climate change and the impact of climate change and the drivers of climate change because of data. Mm. But a lot of the data that we see or hear relates to the natural science aspect of it, the environmental aspect of it. And you can go to the next slide. One of the things that came out of the, uh, that 1.5 degree report, and this has continued in the working group two and three reports of the, the sixth assessment report by the, uh, the IPCC, there was a recognition in the scientific reports that non-climactic factors, that differences in vulnerability and exposure arise from non-climactic factors and from multi-dimensional factors. And these are, this creates differential risk. People who are, who are socially, economically, culturally, politically, institutionally, or otherwise marginalized are especially, especially vulnerable to climate change, but not only to the impact but also in some cases to the responses, the adaptation and mitigation responses. And I think this is a really important point that it, for us to understand what those impacts are, uh, to understand how those that is differentiated, we need to consider uh, 
gender data. And next slide, please. The differentiated impacts um, from the first report we did, there's a second report that's come out this year that where we uh, synthesized information provided by um, countries and, and from, from uh, organizations who participate in our process. Um, but in the first report we did on this, the differentiated impacts come out in three broad categories. It's differentiated around actual or perceived vulnerability. It's very important to consider that women are, who are often referred to as being more vulnerable are not inherently more vulnerable just because they're female. And so the, the, there is also a, a perception it's not only about actual um, vulnerability. There's differentiation also in who's making decisions on climate change as well as the attitudes towards responses to climate change impacts. And finally, there's also a differentiation in relation to benefits, who benefits from action on climate change. And here, I think it's important for us to think about the fact that countries are having to look and transform systems. So this is also an opportunity for transformation in terms of social inclusion and gender equality as well. Excellent. Moving beyond vulnerability, thinking about the fact that every, by its nature, an anthropogenic greenhouse gas emission is caused by a human. It's caused by uh, decisions, behaviour, choices, action or inaction of people. So in order for climate policy and project or program, the impacts, benefits, anything that involves people, we need to consider gender for it to be as effective and as just as possible. And at this point, in this critical de decade, in at this moment in time, we need every kind of pol change policy project or program to be as effective as possible for us to meet the objectives of the Convention and the Paris Agreement. And I started with that picture in part because even a future of two degrees is is not one that we want. Um, we, ideally, we wouldn't even be going to 1.5, but 1.5 we really need to hold on to. So the agenda under the UNFCCC, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but it's um, evolved over time from the initial decision around the increase in representation and participation of women in the process to the current uh, Gender Action Plan and Lima Work Program on Gender, which has, uh, it, through this process, we've seen a growing understanding of what we're talking about when we're talking about gender and climate change. And whilst there is still a need to focus on the representation and participation of women in all their diversity in the UNFCCC process, it's one part of a much bigger uh, a discussion around what it is that's driving climate change and these issues, these systems issues, the, the uh, causes of gender inequality are linked also to the causes of climate change. Next slide, please. So the Gender Action Plan has five priority areas. Uh, one on capacity building, knowledge management and communication, on gender balance, uh, women's participation and leadership, coherence, and this is coherence across the UNFCCC process, but also across the UN system. Uh, and this is an example here at UNFPA about why it's important for us to be working together as a system to, to address these issues. Gender responsive implementation and means of implementation, and here means of implementation is financing, but it's also capacity building and technology development and transfer and monitoring and reporting. And I would say one of the things about this is that there isn't any part of that priority area where data isn't important. And so I think this is a, a, the point about um, that Bajir was making before about the fact that it also came up that way in the, uh, the, the, the Jeff process 
data is fundamental to us being able to inform our policy and, and as I say, make things as effective as possible. So we are, as the Secretariat, we are I'm co-lead um, of the Feminist Action for Climate Justice Action Coalition in part because of the coherence priority area and where we joined this uh, coalition also on this data alliance because it is fundamental to delivering on, on the objectives also of uh, the Gender Action Plan under the UNFCCC. And I think that's the end of my slide. Perfect. Thank you so much, Fleur. It's really, really helpful and grounding in particular for how um, what we've always seen uh, the Gender Action Plan as this really important vehicle um, to uh, funnel is the only word that comes to mind, but funneling information of that is being collected in different ways across this, what can be a, a global action plan. Um, and it's one of the areas where, for example, we do um, we have a, a, a website and an app called the Gender Climate Tracker, where we've been for many years now doing analysis on women's participation data, as well as data on countries that have gender included in their nationally determined contributions. Um, and it's one of those examples of when we were talking under the Generation Equality Forum, um, that data exists in its own space, but it has to exist in collaboration with both the Gender Action Plan, as well as data that other groups are collecting. So again, it's one of those things that pushed us towards this alliance of how do we continue to collect the data in the spaces that we um, understand and that we're, we're, we're participating in and we have um, information for, but making sure it's feeding into and outreaching to a whole host of, of, of different groups and communities who need that information to use it in different ways. Um, and towards the implementation of the Gender Action Plan is just one example of that. And I'd love to pass over to um, Sainan Zhang from UNFPA now, who's the technical specialist on data innovation and analysis here. We've been super grateful to UNFPA's contribution to this collaboration, both in terms of your technical expertise in population data, as well as around gender-based violence, for example. Um, and I would invite you to speak to how that works in terms of your gender and environment um, and in terms of the gender and environment nexus, particularly in relation to UNFPA's upcoming or ongoing strategic plan. So over to you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Sanan Zhang. I'm a technical specialist in the population and the development branch, UNFPA. Um, I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues from the Gender, Human Rights, and the Culture Branch who also contributed to this uh, presentation. So in the next 10 minutes, let me uh, introduce some of the UNFPA's work uh, around the gender environment. Next uh, slide. So UNFPA's work um, more focused around uh, on the, the, the climate change uh, perspective regarding the environmental data. So, um, Firstly, some background why this topic on climate change, population, and gender is important. We know that the climate change is threatened to uh, keep to human life, livelihood, and property. It forces people to move, and uh, it causes uh, the food insecurity and increased the uh, conflicts over resources. So it's, it's estimated that around 260 million internal migration will happen by 2050 due to climate change. Um, in the maps shown on the right side, give an example of the in-migration and out-migration in the East Africa areas. Um, so the, the red color shows the estimated areas that most likely will happen, will have more in-migration in the future years. And then, then the blue areas is uh, the areas with high probability that will have more and more uh, out migration mm -hmm. due to those areas and not uh, suitable for people to live related to the climate change. So women and girls that of probably bear more environment burden, including the impact from climate change. How we understand this? For example, in a sudden unsaid event, such as the hurricane of blood happened, it might cause people a uh, next life. It might cause people lost their property, 
and cause their children are not able to afford to go to school. And this may cause their daughters have to marry at an early age. So this we can see is associated with child marriage. <coughs> and it's also associated with trafficking or increase of GBV, especially in IDP camps or in, among those refugees. This already has that evidence. And it's also not uh, difficult to understand that uh, for pregnant women, if this uh, acute has a uh, disaster happen, so they need to be immediately access to emergency obstetric care and uh, um, newborn care. This might not be possible because the road is destroyed, or the health facility destroyed due to those uh, uh, climate related disasters. So we can say indeed, women and girls are more vulnerable in some ways. And climate change exaggerate all this uh, inequality, which are already among women and girls um, in across the from individual to their relationship in family, all their uh, status in the society and the community, which are already existing, but uh, it's going to be exaggerated by the climate change impact. So for the next slide, please. So for the um, study and research figure that this impact on women and girls are different across regions in the world. And this is related to the different regional context and uh, the situation in the country. And these uh, are some examples of the evidence. They are around the GBV, but you can see the impact of some areas are much higher than some other regions. But this uh, research is very powerful to show the data evidence, how and to what extent people are affected, especially women and girls affected by climate uh, change impact. <coughs> so next slide. So back to UNFPS work. UNFPS data work around the gender population and climate change uh, I highlight um, two areas. And it's not covered all areas of UNFPS work because we do a lot of brilliant work in the field and country and regional offices. So these are two examples. One is so we are trying to um, increase this uh, the knowledge and the data on the impact of climate change on people, especially through agenda lens. And why I say this is important, because this is a data gap, it's challenging. For example, when we talk about forced migration because of climate change, nearly migration is a mountain casual reasons, and climate change is just one of the reasons. And it could be because of socioeconomic, political reasons, demographic reasons, cultural reasons, or personal desire. So how you can understand what exactly reason people migrate because of climate change, or to what extent climate change impact the person's de decision among the different factors. So this is a very tricky area. We're seeing, we are trying to have research building these gaps, better understand to what extent climate change can impact on population, especially on women and girls. So this is on the data uh, uh, generation and the knowledge and not filling the in gaps of knowledge as well. On the right side, the box shows, uh, shows another component of our work, leverage the existing data from census, from survey, health facility, road system, and the environment, combining them through geospatial data and analysis, we understand where people are vulnerable and, uh, and uh, how to identify the priority areas that intervention and programming needed. So this is uh, another data generation, but combining the existing data to transfer into helpful, uh, helpful information and guide the policies and, uh, uh, and, uh, and programs. And those policies could be like um, national adaptation planning and disaster risk reduction, resilience building. We are already helping countries like Indonesia, Caribbean countries on, on these uh, areas. So these are two, uh, two areas, but uh, let me uh, focus on the risk mapping, because this is a very interesting area and uh, using geospatial analysis. Next slide. So on, on our risk mapping, we have two levels of work. One is global, the other is country level. On global, we're using global population integrated with uh, climate risk uh, uh, areas, and uh, currently we're focused on flood. Um, and we only focus on exposure because it's global level, and uh, due to limited data, we're mapping the population exposed to flood risk of disaggregated by country and by key population groups. And you can see we have a gender lens, especially if we focus on the um, adolescent girls, pregnant women, and the women at that age. Um, then the, the, the next step we're going to like uh, uh, expand it to seven national level and also expand it to more uh, risk, not just flood, but also landslide, drought, or heat wave, or we hit highland, uh, air pollution, a lot of potentials. At uh, country level, we are, uh, we are adding more data, such as census data, survey data, health facility to, to really understand not just exposure, 
but a vulnerability and a lacking of, lack of coping capacity. So it's a really need an integration of uh, all kinds of uh, data sets. We also have the gender component focus on where GBV is small, GBV prevalence rate is high, and people lack of access to, for example, sexual and reproductive health services. Okay, next slide. So just to quickly show some example of the work. This is a global level work. We extract all the global uh, flood risk area. And next slide, integrated with population. Here's showing the by country, the woman at a reproductive age is post to flood zone. And um, next slide, we also launched a, a global like, exposure uh, uh, dashboard. And you can see in the bottom, we have we disaggregated seven population groups by country. Uh, this is ongoing work. Now, as I mentioned, we are going to expand it to more groups at seven national level and incorporate more in the data. And we're hoping to collaborate with colleagues uh, who are working on this similar area. Next slide uh, to the country level. So now we are focusing on a case study like Malawi using the recent census data 2017 census population census. And because it's census, we have a high resolution down to not even village, but even to uh, enumeration area level, which is the smallest unit in the population that is collected. So we're mapping the overlay the high resolution population with the recent flood zone due to the typhoon area, uh, typhoon Anna. Next slide. And the results can show by enumeration area level how many people are in each EA and are exposed in flood and what the proportions are. So this just shows the very high resolution um, uh, local level knowledge. And uh, uh, so we just uh, finished this step, but next step, of course, we are going to leverage the census data with a wide spectrum of information of their socioeconomic conditions, the access to electricity and access to clean water, and then beyond the household, their access to, for example, health facilities and uh, public transportation to put all this indicator together as a risk index at a subnational level. And we are going to deliver to government. Um, hopefully in one or two months. This is uh, the collaboration with the uh, country regional office and the national statistics office. Um, so, um, so basically, I stop here. Next slide. Um, so, UNFP here is a part of this uh, uh, JADA, the Agenda Invented Data Alliance, and uh, we are very happy uh, that we can hopefully contribute to this uh, um, uh, this alliance by bringing more reliable population and environment data research results. And we also look forward to know more about other agencies' work and look for uh, the opportunities to collaborate uh, if you have the uh, common efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Sandan, very much. Such critical data, and it's interesting. It speaks directly to you know one of the things that um, brings us together is also to to not only make this alliance a reality, but to bring. Um, to make data effective for more effective policy and more effective implementation. And everything you were speaking of reminded me of this morning, I was at a meeting of countries talking about feminist foreign policy um, and the minister from Pakistan was there and, and said, you know, we need feminist foreign policy, not just stated, but operationalized. And she spoke about the impact of over 600,000 pregnant women and the absolutely life altering floods that Pakistan is facing right now. Um, and, you know, how this type of data is absolutely necessary for countries thinking about their own foreign policy. Um, and how do we bring life to what, what is being collected? It also connects for me as civil society to um, a campaign that we're participating in today, which is around um, uh, bringing attention to the issue of loss and damage and 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 a pol political campaign um, to try to get countries to to do more on that issue. All of these things are connected and partly why us working in collaboration is so helpful. Um, so I'd love to move to another um, UN uh, organiz agency who's doing incredible work um, on thinking about gender and its intersections, uh, uh, the gender and environment data intersection. So Sarah uh, Duerto Valero, who's joining us virtually quite late. Thank you so much, Sarah, for, for doing so. Um, and has been doing incredible work, particularly thinking about um, this nexus of data with countries as well as globally. So without further ado, I'll pass over to you, Sarah. Thank you so much, Bridget, and thank you, colleagues, for having me. Uh, just bear with me one second. I share my screen. Um, you should be able to see it now. Um, so, okay, uh, perfect. So, um, 
today I want to talk to you about uh, some of the, like like Bridget says, some of the work that we've been doing to really find solutions to filling so this gender environment data gaps. I feel like for a while we've been talking about the need to fill these gaps. Um, and, and it's so exciting to see so many colleagues in the room working towards this goal. So, so very exciting to see what everybody else is doing as well. Um, so let me uh, begin talking about this, right? Like, where do we start when we want to fill uh, gender environment data gaps? So uh, first, I, I wanted to make sure that we understand what we mean by gender and, and the environment, at least, uh, you know, according to, to us and you and women, some of the work that we've been doing. Um, gender and the environment is such a massive topic. So, so obviously it includes anything to do with disasters, such as disaster deaths, injuries, damage to service, like, especially services that are important to women, like obstetric care facilities, et cetera. Um, it also includes things like environmental related conflict, displacement, violence, um, on the climate change side, obviously exposure and preparedness to the effects of climate change, but also the impacts that, that climate change has on time use and different allocations of, of time, health effects, economic effects. An important point that was also mentioned earlier is the capacity to cope, right? So whether women and men own assets, whether they have access to finance, uh, their dependence of natural resources for their livelihood, um, the existing pre-existing inequalities that also condition their capacity to cope. Um, in addition, very important component is environment-related livelihoods, um, including participation in green jobs. This determines women and men's vulnerability, uh, their contribution to environmental conservation and degradation, for instance. And then kind of like cross-cutting topics across all of this is, for instance, environmental decision making in the context of disasters, of climate change, of natural resource management, um, women and men's different levels of agency, both inside and outside the home, and, and, and mobility, right? So a huge kind of like area uh, to cover, lots of data gaps. Um, so the first step really to start filling the data gaps is to, to look at some of the existing frameworks to see how we can best uh, main stream gender in some of these frameworks. So we have a lot of frameworks that cover, you know, more or less in detail the environment. So ranging from the SDG indicators, which of course has some, some environment goals, to the same type framework indicators on disasters, to the global set of climate change indicators that focus specifically on climate change, to many others like the global biodiversity framework, the system of environmental and economic accounts, many others, right? Which include gender um, to you know, lower or higher degree, uh, but we are uh, working hard with our colleagues in UNSC and many other partners to mainstream gender frameworks as requested by the Statistical Commission during its visitor session. Um, but while we're doing this work, of course, uh, there is, you know, countries have, have come to us and, and told us, listen, we need to start measuring this because we have our own national policies that we need to monitor, for instance. So we can't be waiting uh, until, you know, there's a global standard. So in the meantime, uh, there's at the regional level and at the country level, many different initiatives that have started um, uh, appearing, right? So in, in Asia and the Pacific, for instance, um, through member state consultations, we have created a, a regional set of gender and environment indicators that includes the areas that you see there on the screen. Um, different countries have also started collecting data. So for instance, Mongolia has a sustainable development vision 2030 that puts environment at its center and mainstream gender. Um, they came to us for support to implement a national gender and environment survey, which was implemented last year. Um, the, in the Pacific, the roadmap on gender statistics, for instance, also puts gender and the environment as a key priority area. And we are supporting several Pacific Island countries to conduct gender and environment surveys. Um, Tanzania, for instance, has a national strategy on gender and climate change. And to my knowledge, it is the first country to include uh, climate change related questions in their national census. Um, similarly, in Tonga, they have a, a national policy uh, on gender that includes a, a whole section on environment, and we are in the process of supporting them to collect data uh, through a national survey on gender and the environment. So there's a lot going on at, at the country level. So how do we start filling some of these data gaps a bit more systematically? So I'll, I'll walk you through some of the work that we are doing in UN Women, of course, uh, in addition to a lot of the work that all the other members of JADA and, and many other people are doing. Um, so first, uh, we have the, the first kind of like more direct way of filling uh, these, these gaps is by collecting data, right? 
So um, we have designed a model questionnaire on gender and the environment in partnership with ILO, FAO, IUCN, UNEP, SCAP, and SPP. Um, the model questionnaire includes 10 modules on many different topics of gender and the environment from you know, disasters to climate change, to asset ownership, to environmental livelihoods. Uh, it's able to generate more than 100 gender environment indicators, um, has already been conducted uh, by the government of Mongolia as a national representative survey, um, piloted in several regions of Bangladesh. Uh, data collection is currently ongoing in Samoa and Tonga, and many other countries have since kind of reached out to us and asked for support to conduct similar surveys. Um, if you're interested in looking at the questionnaire, it's online in, in data.unwomen.org, and, and you can find it there. Um, we are about to publish also methodological guidelines for, for countries to better implement the survey. Uh, besides the surveys, which, you know, we're going to have increasingly available data and we will be publishing online, of course. Um, we uh, Another way of starting to fill these data gaps is by integrating geospatial data with survey data, which is what, what um, uh, our colleagues from UNFPA were talking about a second ago. Uh, so in our case, we have integrated demographic and health survey data with different geospatial variables to see how uh, climate-related variables affect gender-related outcomes. Um, so we uh, used a random forest algorithms as machine learning um, to look at the explanatory power of these variables, and we follow that with logistic regression analysis to determine the strength and dire direction of these associations. And we saw that there's some variables like the increasing drought episodes, increasing risk of floods, uh, aridity index, increases in temperature, for instance, have pretty significant effect on gender-related variables such as child marriage, adolescent births, uh, the prevalence of intimate partner violence, and the availability of clean water and clean fuels, which of course we know affects women disproportionately. What you see here um, is one example only of Timor Leste. We've done this in many countries. Uh, so this uh, map here shows the clear association between um, the clusters that have high intimate partner violence rates, which are the yellow dots, and the clusters that have high RAD2 levels, which are the light blue dots. Again, when we replicate this analysis for uh, other countries, we see that there is a pattern. So in the first graph, you see that in the arid clusters, uh, child marriage rates are higher in almost every country where we, where we conducted the analysis. In the second graph, you see that uh, in the arid clusters, adolescent birth rates uh, tend to be higher. So on and so forth. Uh, for, for all the indicators that we tried, it was pretty clear that we could see patterns. Um, a third way to start filling data gaps is to draw from administrative data. Uh, we did this, for instance, in the Pacific, where we uh, collaborated with um, Pacific Power Utilities, also in partnership with SPC. Uh, to ask them to provide data on the number of women that work in each of these uh, utility firms. Um, and at what level, right? Technical level, managerial level, or just simply staff. So you can really see uh, the, that the picture is pretty far from parity in, in, in all the countries. Um, and finally, one last way to, to look at some of the connections between gender and the environment is by drawing from other non-conventional data sources. Uh, in this case, we did this by looking at big data, um, so in particular, Google searches. So we overlaid um, uh, Google searches for violence-related keywords and we, uh, with actual events, actual um, disaster or hazardous events, right? And we see, this is just one example, we did it for many countries, uh, for the Solomon Islands, it is quite clear that when the COVID-19 mobility restrictions overlap with a drought, um, the number of online searches for violence against women really increase. So this includes searches uh, from very general searches like how to cover bruises in my face or my husband's abusing me to help seeking searches such as um, um, violence hotline, for instance, uh, that, that sort of thing. So again, for every country where we try this analysis, we see that there are clear patterns. Um, so these are just some examples of some of the work we've done, but is this enough? 
I would say no, it's not enough. There's many areas on gender and the environment that, that we need to fill data gaps. So again, data is very important for all of us to work together in, in filling these data gaps, um, the, the very many data gaps that, that exist. Uh, it is also very important that we promote the use of the data. So not, ge not just generating the data and stopping there, but actually making sure that people know where to find the data, how to interpret it and how to use it. So um, in UNUMEN, we've produced a number of publications that are geared towards policymakers um, with very kind of like uh, relatively simple uh, graphs and, and easy to digest. We have also published uh, a bit more complicated statistical papers for the for the uh, um, academic and statistical community. Um, also, of course, you know, infographic, social media materials, that sort of thing. Um, and I've included here a picture of the meeting just because I think it's it's uh, a very important part of the data use process that we sometimes kind of forget about, which is organizing national dialogues between all the key counterparts within and outside government to assess the, the information needs before going ahead and collecting any data and filling these gaps to make sure that all the surveys and all the data collection and analysis exercises really respond to the needs of the data users in the end to promote data use. So having these dialogues, not, not just at the national level, but also at the regional and global level is very important. Um, so I just thought I, I, I just made this reflection about data use because as a statistician, I, I often tend to forget about this last step. So, um, and I think I'm not alone there, uh, but maybe I'll stop here. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sarah. It's a, a really an incredible wealth of information. And I, I think you're absolutely not alone in all of the work that we do on the collection and the reports, and then making sure that we actually um, have attention on the use of that data as well, which it seems like there's excellent progress on. And you're already inspiring me for things we might be pushing for in the midterm review of the gender action plan so of activities. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to quickly pass to Dilly Severin, who's the interim executive director of Data2x. I think your interest in this topic is, is right there in the name. Um, and we've been so, again, proud to have uh, to be partnering with you in such an active way around Jada. And would just love to invite you to speak to, um, you know, the global normative policy frameworks, including spaces like CSW, um, the the data gaps and solutions that you see that exist and links to resilience um, that really drive Data2x to be part of this alliance as well. Thanks, Bridget. And I apologize, I talk a lot with my hands. So if I'm giving you whiplash, please just, um, <laughs> just flag. Um, I'll also try to keep myself on time. So thank you again, Bridget, and thank you to our co-host, uh, UNFCCC, uh, UNFPA, UN Women, and we do. Um, Bridget already mentioned who I am, so I'll just go ahead and talk about, you know, Data2x. Uh, we are a civil society organization and a gender data alliance that mobilizes action to make gender data central uh, to global efforts to achieve gender equality and the sustainable development goals. So today it's really my pleasure uh, to speak about the global policy context and why we need gender environment data uh, for decision making. Sarah already set us up really nicely to talk about use uh, and to boost community resilience uh, specifically. Uh, we've heard a lot from my co-panelists about um, how gender inequalities are exacerbated during crises. Uh, we know that women, girls, and gender diverse communities often have less access to information um, and resources uh, needed to support their own resilience. So at Data2x, we really see gender data as critical uh, to supporting uh, the resilience of, of communities to crisis, uh, to crises that are either an environmental, uh, climate, or, or uh, otherwise. Um, how, what is the connection? Where does the gender data fit in? So uh, we see gender, better gender data needed not only to document the disparate impacts of climate or environmental crises on women, girls, and gender diverse groups, uh, but also importantly to inform policy um, and the design of relief and recovery efforts. Um, the good news uh, is that uh, the need for gender environment data is already established uh, in global climate policy. Uh, so, for example, the Sendai Framework on Disaster Risk Reduction emphasizes the need for decision making based on sex disaggregated data. Um, both the Convention on Biological Diversity uh, and the Gender Action Plan within the UN Convention to Combat Desertification uh, recognize the need to develop 
baseline uh, gender indicators toward national climate targets. So all good news. And of course, Fleur has outlined very beautifully for us uh, the UNFCCC's Enhanced Lima Work Program, which calls for increased technical capacity building and availability of, of gender data. Um, really exciting for us this year is that the UN uh, Commission of the Status of Women also agreed on historic recommendations for gender data. Um, so this included the first ever reference to the need for gender data use in policy making. So a win right there. Uh, it also included a strengthened language on the importance of gender data across all stages of the policy process. Uh, language was reinserted on the need to finance gender data, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and support for research and evidence on the links between climate change and associated impacts on, on women and girls. Um, all of this uh, is key to filling knowledge gaps and advancing an intersectional policy uh, approach. So in many ways, uh, the enabling environment for the use of gender environment data has been strengthened. Uh, next slide, please. Um, Unfortunately, uh, gender data gaps remain. Um, I try not to be the bearer of bad news, so I didn't put too many stats on here. But um, uh, just recently, UN Women's Gender Snapshot shows us that less than half of countries have data needed to effectively monitor SDG 5. Um, fewer still have regularly collected that data over time, which of course makes it quite difficult to measure our progress. Um, and as you've heard from all of my, my co-panelists, data on the gender environment nexus is especially scarce. Um, so for example, even though we've seen such amazing work and such amazing progress, you know, even at a baseline level, no internationally standardized framework to monitor climate change currently exists. Um, of course, you can imagine how that impedes our efforts to track the disproportionate impacts uh, of climate change and environmental uh, crises on women, girls, and gender diverse communities. Uh, broad country coverage of women's access to and management of land and natural resources is, of course, lacking. And such data collection um, in conflicts and crisis settings is, of course, even, even harder. Um, for us at Data2x, one of the biggest gaps that we are concerned about is the resource gap. Um, so, you know, we know that gender, gender data systems really suffer from chronic underinvestment. So between 2015 and 2020 alone, core gender data systems were underfunded by an estimated $450 million per year, which is really uh, uh, something that uh, is, is the hope we can address. Um, and we know, looking at COVID, um, that more than half of national statistical offices in low and middle income countries experienced budget cuts during the pandemic. So, of course, their capacities are even further constrained to track progress on these issues. So we know that without further action, um, the unique inequities faced by women, girls, and gender diverse communities will, will remain invisible, which is something that we don't want. Um, next slide, please. I promised that I would not only give bad news. Um, so I'm gonna talk about signs of progress. Um, so Data2x recently released uh, the state of gender data, which you see up here, uh, which provides a snapshot of gender data progress uh, to date. And you see the three dimensions that we, we've tried to capture the progress along. So financing, um, solutions, and commitments. Uh, this part of my remarks, we'll talk about some exciting solutions. Um, so one uh, is the 50 by 2030 initiative uh, to close the agricultural data gaps. Um, this addresses the gap in agricultural data in low and middle income countries with the goal of strengthening evidence-based policy making to support women's access uh, to land and natural resources. Um, Bridget spoke amazingly um, about the gender climate tracker, which we're also really excited about. Um, so uh, a really key uh, solution coming from one of our partners. Um, and then, you know, to, to wrap up um, and really lean into the solutions, the next slide page, what will it take to scale up policies and examples of solutions like these to address the financing gap and more um, so that we really can improve the resilience of women, girls, and, and gender diverse communities. So a few things. Governments must contribute to closing the global gender data financing gap. If there's no money, we, we can't move forward. Um, this should come from domestic resources but also should come from international development assistance. Um, as a community, we must also move beyond data collection to use. I think we've heard that message over and over again today. 
Um, and ultimately, we must adopt an intersectional approach uh, to ensure response and recovery efforts really are fully inclusive. Um, and part of that means engaging communities themselves in data collection efforts and disaggregating data across multiple categories uh, to ensure their experiences are reflected and integrated into advocacy and policymaking efforts. So I really will conclude by saying this is part of why we are so excited uh, to be a part of the Gender and Environment Data Alliance, because at the end of the day, I think what we're all saying is that collaborative action is the only way to effectively address the need to fill uh, the gender environment uh, gaps that we are experiencing. So we are really proud uh, to be a founding member uh, of JADA and grateful for our partnership um, with all the organizations here and others to work towards catalyzing more use of gender data and policy uh, to address the needs of women and girls. Thank So much, Dilly, for the uh, ending with the calls to action. It's always, I always love that. <laughs> um, and I'm going to hand over now to Jamika Chakma, who um, we as a collective are very thrilled to have as a, a lead of part of a team of two amazing consultants we've been able and privileged to bring on, um, I should say, with the with support from um, from CETA. Uh, to uh, Tramita and her colleague, we are uh, Asian-based feminist researchers and specialists in grassroots data collection, feminist participatory action research, and climate environmental justice. And their work is hopefully and will be hugely important in guiding Jada's feminist and intersectional approach um, to how we think about this work. Um, so my question to you, Tramita, is what could feminist, intersectional, non-traditional um, gender environment data look like um, and or achieve. Over to you. Thank you, Bridget. Uh, so hello, everyone. My name is Rimita Chakma. I'm a feminist researcher and organizer originally from an indigenous community in Bangladesh, and I'm currently joining you from Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. So it's my great pleasure to uh, share this panel with such esteemed speakers. Um, I would like to begin my presentation by highlighting the fact that uh, the global women's movement has been warning us about the environmental crisis for, for a long time. And they have been advocating for the recognition of rural and indigenous women's critical role in sustainable development um, and environmental management. So here in the timeline, I have just highlighted three key events in 1991, the women's movement organized two global conferences on women and the environment. Uh, to strategize toward the 1992 UN Conference on Environment and Development, or uh, what is known as the Earth Summit, uh, which was in 1992. So in the 1992 Earth Summit, hundreds of women from all around the world adopted the Women's Action Agenda for a healthy planet. Um, and then in 1995, we had our um, you know, blueprint progressive action plan, Beijing Declaration and a Platform for Action which was adopted by most governments around the world, which recognized women's critical role in influencing sustainable consumption and production patterns in the management of natural resources. So women and, and the environment was one of the 12 critical areas of concern, uh, which already highlighted the need for states to mainstream gender perspective in sustainable development policies and programs, um, as well as the importance of involving women in environment and related policy formulation and decision-making. Uh, but somehow we have handed over most of the power, resources, and opportunities to manage our environment to very unfit leaders, right? So women have been saying this for decades. Um, so decades of inaction by those in the positions of power uh, has led us to this moment of unmanageable, almost unmanageable environmental crisis and disproportionate levels of gender inequality. So I think this perspective is very important to understand uh, where feminists are coming from. Uh, so the previous panelists have already highlighted um, the status quo of the gap in the gender and environment data. So we know that um, you know, the Beijing platform for action already outlined what actions need to, need to be taken and we are repeating many of them already. Uh, but the SDGs um, are designed in a way where the gender data and the environmental data are sort of um, not, you know, it's not meshing. So it's important that we connect the two, um, which also was mentioned previously by another panelist. Uh, we also know most national uh, statistical systems are yet to mainstream gender environment statistics. And we saw only 33% of the data was available, 50% and so on. 
Um, so basically gender and environment data has been limited to um, qualitative or very small scale quantitative studies only. Uh, so we, we acknowledge that. So I would like to talk about um, that gender and environment data is not only about compiling sex desegregated data, uh, which we have been doing, right? So we need to capture socially constructed vulnerabilities and, and look at the specific needs and challenges and priorities of women, men, girls, and, and boys in relation to the environment. Uh, but if we look at the traditional mainstream data, it is usually quantitative. So we are all familiar with census and survey, um, about which often you know, it tends to contain gender biases in the design itself, right? Um, so often also statistics do not record marginalized groups um, and make women and girls subjects invisible in the data. Um, one example is you know, the data we collect uh, to, to calculate the gross domestic product or the GDP, you know, the marker for progress or development uh, does not count uh, women's you know, unpaid care and domestic work or you know, the work they do to produce subsistence you know, farming, um, uh, food, the, the, the food they produce through subsistence farming. So this means if we rely on traditional data, we can end up uh, with gender blind policymaking. Um, so this is important. I think it, um, that on the other hand, if you look at some non-traditional feminist methods of collecting data, it, it is focused on qualitative and going in depth. And uh, it acknowledges that you know, there are situated knowledges of women and girls, because if they are closest to the environment, they, they have knowledges that you know, we can learn from. Um, we also, you know, through feminist research, uh, we can address unequal power relations that hinder their development, uh, and also consider women and girls as, as agents of social and structural change, rather than just victims and you know, vulnerable subjects. Um, and of course, it was also mentioned previously, uh, incorporating intersectional analysis uh, is really important to explain the complexity of multiple forms of inequalities experienced by women, you know, at the nexus of gender and environment. Um, so if we want our uh, policies to be progressive and gender transformative, we need to resource and scale up feminist research um, because, you know, the, we need to engage communities to understand uh, which, you know, what to prioritize. Uh, for example, we, we need to ask, right, in the 2015 Nepal earthquake, for example, why more women died than men, right? And then of, of those women who died, how many were women with disabilities? So that, that sort of designing is really important. Um, so I would like to then um, talk about how for, you know, in the previous uh, presentation by, um, UN Women, we saw that in the, in the Asia Pacific, in one of the studies uh, done by UN Women, UN ESCAP, UNEP, you know, IUCN, um, they looked at what you know, data is available and capacity gaps in the gender environmental nexus and looked at you know, and compared them with the SDGs uh, indicators and beyond, and then uh, put forward recommendations for six priority areas. Um, but as, you know, as we know, this is a massive area. So for JEDA to, uh, start it, its work, the focus will be on women's uh, climate resiliency because it is a, at this critical ju juncture of climate crisis is really important to bring attention to the issue. It's a matter of survival. Um, and it's important that we apply a combination of gender equality, human rights, intersectional feminism and climate justice lenses when we design um, those data collection. Um, or how we define what, what you know, gender and environment data should look like and what should be prioritized. Um, so to wrap up, feminist intersectional, non-traditional gender environment data uh, should acknowledge that rural women are uniquely positioned to tackle climate crisis because they are the group that is closest to the natural environment. Uh, we need gender and environment data that highlights women's potential leadership and existing leadership in fighting the climate crisis rather than portraying them as helpless victims. Um, they have been you know, solving problems for a long time, but we have under-resourced them and undermined them. And it's important we you know, uh, go back to undoing all of the injustices. Um, and therefore, um, the gender and environment data on climate resilience should serve um, the purpose to shape gender transformative environmental policy. Um, 
that this data should address women's human rights uh, in relation to you know climate injustices. Um, should it should uplift women's movements and environmental leadership. Um, promote feminist agroecology on a large scale. Uh, it's happening at small scale now, and it can really help addressing the crisis. And of course, um, should also support the process of climate financing and climate justice for those who have contributed the least to the climate crisis but are suffering the most. Uh, so we need to make sure all of the financing that we are um, fighting for at the global level reach to reach uh, reach the people who are on the forefront. Uh, so with this, I would like to conclude my presentation. Um, time is running out. If you have any questions, please do contact me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Trinita. We're really thrilled and excited to be working with you as an alliance. And I think even just um, parts of what you um, spoke to there is, is uh reminiscent of the conversations we've been able to have and get to where we're in this space of both thinking about what is data, understanding what high level data and mapping exists, thinking about the use of it, and then immediately questioning what does it mean to challenge these data systems themselves um, because they are existing in a structure that we know has upheld inequalities for um, centuries, if not, um, if not more. Um, so I think that we have presented ourselves a, a challenge as an alliance to think about what does uh, gender responsive, resilient data look like? Uh, how can we really focus on the use? Um, but also we feel really excited to tackle that challenge in collaboration together. And we have a, a short opportunity now. We are about five, five minutes or so over time, um, but I've been told we can stay in this room and stay online for a little bit um, past 12, 15 when we uh, aim to end, maybe only 10 minutes or more. Um, so if, but if anyone does have to leave, we, we understand, um, and especially anyone online. But we do um, have the opportunity to hear from you. Um, we did actually ask questions ahead of time um, from virtual participants in particular. Um, I don't know, Katie, if you want to, I would love to particularly take Noeline's question. Um, do you want, I can just read it myself. You can read it right yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So um, we had lots of really great questions that came in online and we've had some more that have come in since the, the conversation started. So thank you all for being such active participants. So um, from Nolene Nabulibu, who's um, the leader of Diva for Equality in the Pacific and one of the founding members of JADA, obviously it's the middle of the night in the Pacific or early morning. So Nolene was wondering, and I thought we could start with this one, there's a massive shortage of gender disaggregated data and analysis at the Environment Nexus especially in the Pacific, where it's needed urgently, even as we already work on these issues of loss and damage and the climate emergency that's upon us. So how can JADA, how can this alliance practically help with the realities of local and indigenous peoples and climate frontline societies and states, as we must now urgently work to save lives and entire communities around the world? So I think that's easy, up. easy first one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, no, but it, it critically important and it gets us to that really critical use question. I'd love to get thoughts from any any panelists who'd like to give um, specific questions. And I think it's a it's a profound question to why are we doing this um, and how do we how do we accelerate real implementation and action on that? Before asking and answering that profound question, I did want to see if there was anyone in the room here. Yes, please go ahead. So if I can ask a different question. Yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I'm Rachel Snow from UNFPA um, Population and Development. And I, I wanted to take a, a, a react to the, the last presentation and the messaging, because I think it's, we don't want to narrow the tent. And my concern is that it's a problem to suggest that traditional sources of data, large quantitative population housing censuses and surveys, et cetera, those are sources of data that are going to lead to gender bias if we analyze those alone. And I am totally understanding and agreed, of course, there's positionality. There have been a lot of gender biases in the construct of data sources. But feminist research does not mean qualitative research alone. And I think if we leave with that message, we, we do ourselves a disservice because it, it, it's just reducing, making the, the tent very small. And, and frankly, 
feminist analysis includes social scientists, quantitative economists, uh, statisticians who do in fact bring innovative ways of looking at traditional data like census that tend to be some of the richest data that are available. So I just want to say, let's keep the tent large. I, I value and appreciate the comments that we need qualitative intersectional data, but some of the biggest data sets are those by the power of those data sets enable us to, to look at multiple forms of discrimination and need. You can't do that with small surveys and you can't easily do that in, in a really clear way often with qualitative, but when you have the power of something, the scale of a census, you have the statistical power to look at multiple forms of discrimination simultaneously. So let's keep our tent wide and 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 bring everybody in because we need we need all. Thank you very much. Thank you for that beautiful commentary and part and really again reminiscent of some of the conversations we've already been able to have as part of this alliance and I think welcome in in that space. Um, and would invite again any panelists as well to comment on that too. Um, any other question that you want to pose from our virtual community? Um, an interesting one from Albert Motivans from Equal Measures 2030. Albert had two questions, one about conjoining data, which we'll get to at the end, um, but asking also whether it would be useful at this first stage to map not just the data ecosystem, but also the stakeholders and needs. Um, and I think the short answer is yes, but maybe Trimita, if you want to respond to Rachel's question, and then maybe also to Albert's question, and then Obviously, anyone else who wants to join. Great. So why don't we, I think that's a great way to give everyone food for thought to close. Tramita, why don't we start with you and then maybe Sarah as well, who are both um, virtual, and then we'll come back to our room here. Yes, I would like to respond to Rachel by agreeing that, yes, uh, my presentation was a critique of the gap in the existing data, in this existing statistics, how it has been done traditionally. Uh, but um, by no means I, I would you know, undermine the need for the census to be more feminist, the census to be more uh, more inclusive, and so on. Um, and also, I was I was saying that the qualitative research that we do is also under resourced. Not that we need to do one more of one or the other. Uh, so I I agree with Rachel that we need we need the data, both quantitative and qualitative data, to be feminist. I think uh, I may have missed the uh, the second question. Was it about the indigenous communities? Is it okay to repeat um, part of the question? Sorry. It's about um, our starting point. So are we mapping the data ecosystem, but also the stakeholders and the needs? So if you want to share a bit about um, the work that you and we have started on that regard. Right, right. Okay, so we just started uh, at the very initial stage. Uh, so we are, Searching, we started with searching the uh, World Cat database, which is you know the formal database, and we will be looking at more informal sources later on. But from there, we started searching keywords, um, and I can tell you a few things about the keywords. Is that when you search in um, women, girls, and climate resilience, for example, it's returning thousands of results, over two thousand results. But when you plug in uh, gender transformative and climate change, we only have 64 results. Uh, when we plug in gender responsive and climate change and policy, we have 110 results. Uh, and these results still have to be screened to see if they, they're relevant for the kind of work we are trying to do. Uh, if you plug in feminist research and climate change, um, it's returning about 52 results of which some of will be, I think only 25 will be relevant, 25%. Uh, and so on. So we are just looking at, uh, it's difficult to filter it, but we are starting to look at what kind of feminist and studies, existing studies exist that, that are looking into, into solutions. Um, and then from there, we will have to go beyond. So we are at a very early stage. Uh, so I hope we can update you a bit more at the end of the, you know, in a few months. I hope I answered uh, your question. Thanks, Jamita. Sorry, they couldn't hear us. Sarah, do you want to come in? Sure, thank you. Um, maybe I'll respond. Uh, since I work very closely with the countries in the Pacific, I'll try to respond to that, uh, to at least part of that big question, right, on, on the Pacific. 
Um, and perhaps that's a little bit also uh, on, on the question uh, by Albert on, on mapping uh, stakeholders and needs. So um, in the Pacific, uh, actually, it's interesting in the work for the Asia Pacific region, obviously, because the, the needs of the Pacific are so important uh, compared to, to other Asian countries, right? Uh, in, in the context of climate change, it's just so urgent. Um, so the Pacific Island countries are actually leading a lot of this conversation uh, on, on gender and climate change. So the way we started working in the Pacific is we put together a roadmap on gender statistics for the Pacific specifically. And the roadmap, and this goes back a little bit to, to the need of maps, stakeholders and needs, was designed by a broad group of people. So National Statistics Office, National Disaster Management Agencies, uh, Ministries of Environment, et cetera, the usual suspects, but also civil society organizations, academicians, et cetera. They all came around the table to design this roadmap. Um, then all the countries agreed on the roadmap and the statistics and the top priority area that came out clearly from across the region was measuring the gender and the environment nexus. Um, so since then, we have done a lot of work in Pacific island countries to really start measuring this nexus. That's why we're implementing this gender environment surveys in Samoa, in Tonga, and Solomon Islands, uh, etc. Um, and one interesting piece of work that, that came out quite clearly when we designed the model questionnaire, that was designed kind of focused. When we brought it to the Pacific, um, the, the Pacific Island countries actually told us that there was an important gap that wasn't reflected, uh, which was the, the need to measure the connections between um, wild forest and forest products and the use of, of some of those forest materials for traditional cultural industries in the Pacific. Uh, so working with the Pacific Gender Statistics Coordination Group, actually, we designed a sequence on measuring these traditional cultural products and the links between, between forests and, the, and these products and climate change and the effects on those. So just to give an example of, of you know, some of the important kind of like collaboration with the, with the grassroots organizations there, the civil society and, and the governments in the Pacific and how this collaboration then in turn influence the global methodology for, for measuring gender and the environment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, Flora, I'm gonna invite you to give us some any thoughts you might have. I'm just really grateful for the discussion because I think this is really important. This is part of why we have this alliance mm -hmm. is also to strengthen the way in which we are, are describing gender and, and environment data, the way it's used, um, who's using it, uh, and, and who's contributing to, to the, to the um, structure of, of that. And so I think this is a very important discussion. We're very grateful for that. Um, and it's something that we need to continue. I think this is, as we go through, I think it's going to be an important aspect of the alliance is not only to to adjust mm -hmm. as we go through, but to record and to communicate about the learning through through this process. Um, and and I think uh, the the point about um, how we ensure those who uh, who need to have the data uh, so urgently, and that and we're talking about the financing. We also need to, you know, not only scale but prioritize, and and that perhaps is also something that we're going to need to think about as an alliance, is where the data is needed most right now, given how the urgency for for some. Excellent, Simon. Can I ask you if you have any final remarks, Nick? Um, no, not to not to um, sell my side. Okay. Yeah, I think all questions covered. Thank you. Thank you. And Dilly, over to you. Thanks. I mean, thanks again for this opportunity. And I guess I will just sort of um, re-emphasize my point on collaboration and convening. I think some of these really thorny questions really come down to how do we bring different actors from different sectors together to unlock these challenges faster, right? So how do we ensure that um, technical experts are connected with policymakers? And how are we providing them with the sort of capacity building and technical assistance to speak to each other, because I think there is a bit of a, almost like a language barrier sometimes between our policymakers and our technical actors. And if we can 
use this um, alliance also to be a resource uh, to some of these critical stakeholders, I think we will also be successful. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I can only I conclude by echoing, um, echoing that in terms of what I think one of the most um, important values of being in, in community together is making sure is both tackling this the translation of language of what are what is the need that we all have what is the interest that we all have in sort of bettering the lives of of people in particular who are facing impacts on the ground who are facing inequalities how do we use the moment of showcasing what is most urgent and connecting to something like a big data mapping that would be inaccessible in any other way that showcases an overlay of the impacts of, of, of violence against women with drought and disaster, that some of us have the tools to communicate that with policymakers, some of us have the tools to communicate that with UN agencies, um, and, and how can we be in collaboration together so that we can make all of this really incredible work more effective towards our overall goal. Um, that's certainly the intention behind being in collaboration together, a recognition that this is so needed. None of us singularly have the answer. Um, we all have different approaches, um, but uh, that together we'll be stronger in, in our uh, resolve and in, in, in the kind of data that we're able to produce. Um, and so just, I think it'd be helpful to finish on that, but I did want to both thank um, Katie in particular, Katie Tobin, who's um, done a lot of work to organize today. UNFPA, again, my colleague Andrea, who's been supporting um, those who are uh, online joining us. And I wanted to pass over to you, Katie, for the last word. Anything you wanted to add, but also on that question of how do you how do you become part of this alliance? Yeah. Thanks, Bridget. And thanks so much to all of our speakers and everyone who's with us online. Um, so the, the biggest question I think that we got from registrants, which is so lovely to read, is how can we be involved? And that's exactly what we're hoping to, to spark with this event today, is, is to start bringing people into the fold of Jada now that we've spent the past year or so figuring out exactly, more or less, still wanting to figure out what it is we're gonna do. Um, so we are really excited to have launched our website and our mailing list sign up this week. So you can see a, a, a screenshot of it on your screens. Um, and if you go to that bit.ly link, join Jada and maybe on, oh, Andrea already put it in the chat for those online. Thanks, Andrea. Um, and what we will initially be sharing with you is our first kind of newsletter or bulletin, or if you have a better name for a newsletter, <laughs> let us know because we're trying to come up with something catchy. Um, that should be coming out within the next couple months so that we can already start to highlight some of the amazing resources that Trimita and B have been finding, a lot of the resources that were shared by our speakers that Jada's founding members are already have already produced and are already working on. Um, and then, you know, by the end of 2023, hopefully we'll have a more defined kind of resource hub and a full website and all of that. So we we're ready for ideas for pilot projects. We're ready for new members. We're ready for ideas of where we can kind of put this information, thinking about the data use point that our colleagues have raised. Um, we really do see Jada as a connector and as, as a way to bring groups together that are working on this because we have all acknowledged the gap and some of the work that's happening to fill that gap. And we just really want to bring people together um, virtually and in terms of collaboration on actual work. So um, there's the link. You all have my email address from registering for the event. So we really look forward to hearing from you and imagining how we can take this forward together. So thank you so much. And please do, for those in the room, eat some of the snacks on your way out. <laughs>